You know, how in the world can such amount of energy be developed biologically to throw these spore masses that far? And Dr. Mone's article redefines these spores as ballistospores. And he points out and mathematically proves that these spores are ejaculated or ejected at a force of 10,000 Gs, uh, 25,000 Gs, 10,000 times more than that which the space shuttle astronauts experience in breaking out of the gravitational pull of the Earth. There is that much force involved in the propulsion. And they come out in paired opposites. A gas bubble forms down here at the junctions, a sheet of uh, liquid sugar forms, and electrostatic field differentials begin, and they start shaking and vibrating. And that's a great statement of the biology on this planet and this dualism of life. This is the yin and yang, the male and the female, the, the paired opposites. That these things are pushed out into thrown out into space in opposite directions at 45 degree uh, angles, and they're thrown far away from the mushroom. Uh, and I think this is, this is representative of something larger. And this is something that I, I will emphasize is that I believe that biology progresses through the repetition of successful models. What has worked previously biologically is built upon in, the, in evolution. And the invention of the computer internet is just a representation of a successful biological model inherent within the structure and the representation of the mushroom mycelium. The mushroom mycelium, you can't destroy the mushroom mycelium by damaging one point. You can't destroy the computer internet by blowing up one computer. That's one of the reasons why it was designed. But this ability to share resources, I think, is integral to our, our model of life on this planet. And I see the computer internet as being a natural evolution of the biologically successful model that's represented in the mushroom mycelium. In northern Nigeria, over 5,000 years ago, this artist made the, uh, a painting. Uh, this has been redrawn. And it was in the Tisili Anajar Plateau, which literally translates to the plateau of, of running uh, rivers. And the uh, northern Algeria, of course, is a very uh, much of a desert environment. The uh, uh, Sahara Desert encroached and expanded. And this, that region now is, is extremely arid. But in this one area, which is, which is uh, uh, latticed work through with hundreds and hundreds of caves, a Japanese researcher uh, and an American uh, anthropologist in the late 1940s uh, were exploring the cave art in the, in the, in in the Tassili Plateau. And uh, they had to take actually uh, camels and whatnot to get in there. It took several weeks uh, of travel to get to this very desolate region. They were running out of water. And they sent one of their guides, you know, let's explore the caves. There's got to be water around here. They were getting very, very desperate. And, and the very hidden reaches of this uh, labyrinthine cave complex, one of their scouts went down and he found water in a pool, this cave which had a domed a ceiling of 10 or 12 feet. And he was gathering water, and he lifts his lantern up, and he was shocked to see this image hovering over them. And unbelievably, for 40 or 50 years, anthropologists never understood the meaning of this drawing. <laughs> Obviously, this artist is very, very excited about mushrooms. <laughs> <laughs> If you had to communicate something through the millennia and mushrooms were your main mo motif, you would make it undeniably obvious that mushrooms were your main interest. And the fact that the, this, this figure also has a bee face speaks, I think, loudly to or underscores this history of using these magic mushrooms inside of honey. And the psychoactive meads or beers, uh, Christian Wretch and a number of other researchers uh, have spoken of this as well is the, before the Beer Act of something like 1394 or something like that, um, and after the Beer Act, only certain, you know, only hops and malt and certain restricted herbs could be used. But prior to that, the meads were, were full of many other different plants and including mushrooms. And so it is thought the wine of Dionysus may have well been impregnated with an infusion of magic mushrooms uh, also. So this is very common to our ancient European roots. The use of mushrooms throughout history spans millennia, and it's almost universal throughout native, uh, native cultures, uh, with, with a few, few exceptions. Um, so this may be with the very mushroom that they were uh, using. This is Slosomy marii, uh, photographed by uh, Gary Linkoff. He went to Algeria, growing on a pine cone. 
Now that area used to have lots of water and it was a riparian zone, so it had mixed deciduous and conifer uh, and pine trees. Um, and he found this in northern Alg Algeria. It's very similar to Slosopy cyanescence, which grows here. Um, here's another example of, of, uh, of Slosopy marii. And I'd like to describe, just a second here. Obviously, Algeria is not a very easy place to visit these days. And so much of this history um, cannot be revisited for a very long time until the political situation gets much, much better. And then in southern Mexico and Central America, uh, and especially in Guatemala, a, uh, catches of mushroom stones have been found over the years. Um, and the mushroom stones uh, were variously proposed as being a model uh, for making a rubber latex ball to, uh, to be involved in the court game uh, between op uh, opposing sports teams. The captain of the winning team would be sacrificed. It was a great honor. Um, certainly a big disincentive, a disincentive in my mind. Uh, it's speculated that maybe they were using mushrooms during, during the games as well. And in these uh, courts, they would find uh, catches of these mushroom stones. They also still turn up in village and farmers' uh, uh, fields and whatnot when they're plowing. And there's been a lot of speculation as to what the mushroom stones mean. I personally believe that they are like a, a coat of arms for a family. You know, you have the eldest son receiving, or the eldest daughter, whatever the case may be, receiving a, the, the family heirloom. This is our mushroom deity. This is our mushroom stone. The mushrooms. Uh, uh, synchronized with rains. A lot of the, the water in Central and South, uh, Central, uh, Southern Mexico and Central America, there are catchments for collecting water. And the absence of water drove civilizations literally to extinction, it is thought. Um, and the, the mushroom stones, um, under the, in the presence of a fire, a flickering light, come alive. Now this collection here was brought together because a graduate student published a thesis on mushroom stones and so mushroom stones from all over the world came to his graduation ceremony. Uh, and a friend of mine who was photographing for Natural Geographic supplied me with this image. Um, and these are the three of the mushroom stones that, that have come my way. Um, this one here is 500 years BC. This one here is 400 years AD. This one here is hard to type exactly to uh, uh, exactly where. But it was a pre-classic period, about 800 years BC in, in the Mayan culture. Um, to about four or five hundred years A.D. And then uh, the mushroom stones became extremely scarce because the, the Christian conquistadors, when they would come over, uh, specifically uh, chose any type of idol to be destroyed uh, as, pagan, as a pagan ritual that they wanted to, wanted to suppress. And so the mushroom cults went underground and remained underground for, for centuries. Uh, this is one that has a woman figure. Many, there are women, uh, there are men figures, and there, there are frogs and lizards, uh, lizard-like uh, creatures that are present in the, in the mushroom stones. This is a tripod one. Some of them are tripods, some of them are flat. There's about 200 of these mushroom stones that are known um, in the world right now. They tend to be made of volcanic rock. Uh, and they're the biggest catches of them have been on the western slope, um, slopes of Guatemala, on the Pacific side. Then years ago, I was up in um, British Columbia at the, uh, at the uh, Native American Museum in Victoria, which is one of the best museums in the world for Native American art. And I found this papoose. And this is from about 1910. And on the back of this papoose, the carried a baby, are three actually taxonomically accurate uh, two-dimensional drawings of liberty caps, Psilocybe semilanciata. And they're blue in color, and they fade. Liberty caps and these lots of mushrooms are what we call hygrophonous. They'll have a true color, but as they dry out, they become lighter in color. And the hygrophanity of the cap is one of the taxonomic features that us mycologists use in describing this, this group as being you know, a taxonomically discrete group. There, I'm very interested in the use of these mushrooms by North uh, Coast Native American cultures. And then the trouble really began. <laughs> In 1957, May 13th, when the cover of Life magazine with Bert Lahr, who was a well-known comedian of that time, R. Gordon Wasson published Great Adventures 3, The Discovery of Mushrooms That Cause Strange Visions, just above teenage allowances. <laughs> <laughs> but imagine the impact during the height of the Cold War 
when three million copies of Life magazine landed on the doorsteps of our parent, many of our parents, when I was, now at that time, I was two years of age. Um, and imagine that something so profound and so different about a new form of spiritualism, a new a way of looking at the, at the world that's rooted in history, you know, came in, uh, uh, right to the very doorsteps of, of middle America. And in, that, in this magazine, which is still available, you can find them on, you know, when you go on, on Amazon.com or internet searches or used bookstores. And it is a very good uh, description by R. Gordon Wasson, uh, who is featured here with a mushroom stone, and Marina, uh, Maria Sabina, and a, a Mazatec mushroom velada, which is a mushroom ceremony. Um, and in this magazine was the first uh, uh, excellent field guide of what these mushrooms look like in nature with uh, watercolors by Roger M. And this is Roger M, uh, Roger uh, M here, and this is R. Gordon Wasson in, uh, in Oaxaca, I believe. And this is the first descriptions, uh, the first painting, so to speak, or uh, an excellent field guide uh, to the magic mushrooms of, of Mexico. Uh, and R. Gordon Wasson were friends of the publisher, and they, and, uh, they asked him to do this article about his research uh, uh, on, on the psychoactive mushrooms of Mexico. And R. Gordon Watson says, fine, but you can't change a word. You cannot edit my work. And we have all know what happens when editors you know, take a, visions, a visionary's work and they try to distill it into something that's more appetizing to the American public. And so uh, the, the, the publisher agreed, but said, we get to choose the title. So the editors of Life magazine said, coined the phrase magic mushrooms. And that's when that name became iconized uh, in American literature. In 1975 uh, was the first conference on psychoactive mushrooms. Uh, this is R. Gordon Wasson here. It was held in, at the Miller Sylvania State Park near Olympia, Washington. It was organized by uh, Jonathan Ott, uh, Preston Wheaton, Jeremy Bigwood, uh, myself, and one or two other individuals. Um, it was at a time of, uh, where the political situation was electric. Uh, no conferences would speak about psychoactive mushrooms because it was the fear of ignorance. Mushroom experts are supposed to know about mushrooms. None of these, none of these mushroom experts that were around within the societies had any clue about these mushrooms. They called them LBMs, still do to this day. Little brown mushrooms, they're too hard to identify. And so when we were at Andy Weil, myself, and uh, Manny Salzman in 1974, 75, we're at the Aspen Mushroom Conference, which was put on by physicians. They actually made, physicians made, made this statement saying, it is better for these kids to go out and collect poisonous mushrooms and die than it is for us to give them the information to prevent poisonings. It is better for them to go to the hospital to have their stomachs pumped to teach them a lesson than it is to give them the knowledge to empower them to distinguish between poisonous and psychoactive mushrooms. You know, no one has died from eating psilocybin mushrooms. Now, there's two reports that are controversial on this subject, and there could be other cofactors. But as one other person, I think, in this room pointed out, there's been like 50 million trips on psilocybin mushrooms and two disputed deaths. This, this underscores uh, a pretty strong safety factor. However, people who are psych psychologically you know, not up to par, people who are dealing with mental illness, people who have weak hearts, people who have other you know, underlying medical conditions, of course these mushrooms are not, it's not advisable for them to use them. And I'm not recommending that people in this room use these mushrooms. Most of you will not benefit from, from them, but some of you will. The people that tend to, to benefit are physicians, philosophers, psychiatrists, computer programmers, artists, poets. Does anyone doubt that, that the, the reason why the United States is on the cutting edge of computer technology is because of the ability of projecting fractals and doing large mathematical equations and vision quests under the influence? If you talk to the communities of software programmers, they will say that's true. But this is the hidden secret about the American's computer industry. There are psychedelic freaks out there all the time. <laughs> Uh, so R. Gordon Wasson is very well known, He's, and he wrote a book called Mushrooms, Russia, and History, which was talked about the differences between attitude uh, of, um, of Eastern European cultures, specifically Russian cultures, being mycophilic, 
having a, an affection for mushrooms, and mycophobic cultures like the Irish and the English who are, uh, have a repulsion for mushrooms. And because of the, the conquest of the world by the English culture, mycophobia reigned for literally hundreds and hundreds of years. But pagan cultures, early uh, Germanic cultures, you know, the Russian cultures, Czechoslovakian cultures, uh, those cultures have allowed a long history of use of these mushrooms and an affection for them to the point that the Russian uh, common language will have 100 to 200 common names for mushrooms. We have 20 or 30, and then David Aurora and Gary Linkoff invent all these other common names because the publishers of their books say, Latin is too complicated, you know, give us a common name. And so many of you know this, David Aurora and Gary Linkoff had to invent hundreds and hundreds of common names. But in these other cultures, they're resident and part of their, uh, part of their, uh, their uh, history. So 1977, Argor, uh, uh, Dr. Gaston Guzman, Gary Menser, I don't remember the name of this person, Stephen Pollock, myself, and Dale Leslie uh, went on this mad mushroom hunt after the conference. And um, Gaston Guzman is the world's number one expert in the genus Psilocybe and has written a monograph. There are presently over 200 species in the genus Psilocybe. This is the genus that has the psilocybin, most of the psilocybin mushrooms. Uh, over 110 of which now are psychoactive. These mushrooms are cir circumpolar, they're, they're all over. Um, and then uh, Gary Menser died and Stephen Pollock died. Um, actually Stephen Pollock was an MD from San Antonio in Texas and uh, Stephen, I knew the, the best of Steve Stephen Pollock and I had the misfortune of speaking to him on the phone when he was assassinated by a hitman. Um, and so it was uh, something I have to deal with, frankly. Um, Steve was trying to patent a species, and I was making fun of him at a conference saying, I don't think you have the right to patent a naturally occurring species. But I found a report that uh, Campbell Soup Company had, had patented a fungus you know, uh, that, was a, uh, that was a unique species. And so I called Steve up to say, Steve, I don't agree with you, but here's a reference in your patent application. You need to have some, some, some citations. And even though I don't agree with you, here's a reference. And unfortunately, he was killed. Um, and it's thought that he was killed because he was very um, outspoken on the use of these mushrooms for, for mental illness. Um, so we went on this wild mushroom hunt and we collect literally hundreds of collections and for Dr. Gaston Guzman's monograph. Uh, so Dr. Gaston Guzman was very familiar with the, the Mexican fungi, but not very familiar with the fungi growing in this bioregion, extending all the way up into British Columbia. And so virtually everywhere we went, it was so strange. 11 o'clock at night, we pull into this city we open up the car. We step down. Psilocybe stuncii is right there. You know, we run into something, somebody else. They're collecting a, a species that we've never seen before. It was a series of coincidences that compounded upon each other that became freakier and freakier until it was commonplace. And it was the norm. And then we're all looking at each other going, this is really strange. We don't normally have this good of luck. But we went all the way up into British Columbia and we made hundreds of collections, many of which turned out to be new species. So I would be remiss in not honoring uh, Terence McKenna, who did, uh, many of you probably know, who died recently. Um, and Terence and I became very good friends the last four or five years of his life. One of the reasons why Terence and I became very good friends, he started making fun of himself. You know, I enjoy that. If you don't have a, a sense of self-humor, self-criticism, then I think that's, that's a real problem. You have to be able to laugh at yourself. And, and Terence um, has come out with some really astonishing concepts and ideas about the interstellar transportation of germ plasm of fungi th throughout space. Well, that was absolutely scientific heresy 15, 20 years ago. But most of you are probably are well aware that this theory is getting more and more substantiated that endospores of bacteria and fungi may well be able to survive interstellar space travel. And perhaps this planet was seeded with endospores of bacteria and fungi long ago and was in a sense inoculated and I suspect that the fungi are throughout the cosmos. Wherever there is water, carbon, hydrogen, nitrogen, you're going to end up with linear chains of self-replicating self matter running through mitosis. You know, it projects mycelial networks and evolve in the fungi. I think fungi are as, if you have matter, you're going to have fungi. You know, that's my belief. I think Terence was really on the right track in so many ways. Several books were pre being produced. If we have focus again, um, that were being produced at this time. And, um, Probably the, one of the worst books was this one and this one. Um, this book here said you could take metal, which is a, a chemical agent used in photography. You could put it on the mushrooms, they turn blue, then the, the mushrooms were active. Absolutely not true. 
a lot of misinformation came out. Um, and then a number of other books, kind of a second generation of books came out that were much, much better. Uh, this is Stephen Pollock's book. This is my first one. Jonathan Ott's first book. Terrence McKenna and Dennis McKenna wrote the Psilocybin Magic Mushroom Growers Guide, which really started a revolution here in the Bay Area. I call it the Psilocybin Cubensis Scholarship Fund, you know? Because <laughs> many, many people have come up to me, you know, after I've said that about the Psilocybin uh, Cubensis Scholarship Fund, saying, yeah, I was one of those people, you know, who grew a little bit of Cubensis in their closet. You know, they never made it much money, but they paid tuition, they paid their rent. They were law-abiding citizens otherwise, but... Uh, um, and then there's a book, excellent book by Gary Linkoff and uh, D.H. Mitchell, uh, Toxic and Hallucinogenic Mushroom Poisoning. I highly recommend this book. It's out of print. And then from the second conference, Psychoactive Mushrooms, this is an anthology of different um, uh, chapters contributed by different groups. And Bob Harris is Growing Wild Mushrooms. And then this great book, which is still somewhat of a mystery, The Golden Guide to Hallucinogenic Plants. <laughs> You've seen The Golden Guide to Minerals, you know, and birds and things like that. What happened here, you know? <laughs> the editorial bo board must have become psychedelicized and said, yes, let's do this. And so this is very rare. If those of you are into rare mush mushroom books and things, you know, this is just an incredibly rare uh, uh, book now, and I highly recommend um, getting it. Then my four books. Um, and then, I, and then I'm, I'm going to jump into some of these species. Um, this is Slosophy cubensis. This is the most, uh, the most prominently well-known psilocybin active mushroom in the world. This is the one that Terrence and Dennis um, went down to the Amazon. Uh, they ate these mushrooms. Uh, they uh, had these visions of flying saucers coming from outer space and this invisible world all around them. And um, they then pioneered using uh, work from San Antonio, which is a uh, mycologist growing button mushrooms, uh, using a case grain technique of growing this mushroom mycelium on, on rye grain and then um, and putting soil on top and growing it. Very easy mushrooms to grow, very prevalent, very common in the southeastern United States. It also circumnavigates the, the equatorial region uh, of the planet. So it's in Thailand, it's in Central America, it's in the Philippines, you know, it's in India, it's, it's all over the world. Uh, the mushrooms can be quite small. This is in Palen from Palenque. And they can be grown under a variety of methods. They're extremely easy to grow. This is being grown outdoors and in mulch beds in a garden environment. A lot of people in Oregon and Northern California grow them in the summertime in the, in the outdoor settings. Um, they can be grown on straw.